Hey, Kulapats, how are you? Hello, thank you, Marcus. I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So you are officially the first screen time interviewee of the second half of Virtual Design Festival because we've realized we reached the halfway points the other day. Only another five weeks to go. <laughs> But I'm just like right just above the under the fold, just like you're saying, at the very top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so welcome to Screen Time, a virtual design festival sponsored by NSK. Kulapat, tell us first of all a little bit about yourself. Who are you and what you do? Well, thank you. I'm an architect designer. Uh, I've been, uh, we started our firm Y Architecture 16 years ago. We have offices in Los Angeles where we started and then New York, we started about 10 years ago. So we, we really do everything. We uh, do master plan, architecture, landscape, object design, installation, museums, and variety of things. And we love to work with people that are not just designers. You know, I think that we like the idea of bringing people together. And that has been such a joy and a fun process to, to work with uh, you know, people. And particularly if the zine's coverage of your work is anything to go by in museums, you do a, an awful lot of museums, it seems. Yes, well, thank you. You know, as, as, as they say, right, you condemn to do what we have done before. I think I love art. You know, I, I really uh, see art as one of the most important essence in my life and other people's life. So I want to convey that passion. I want to convey that intentions, you know, to people. And so hopefully that's the reason why, you know, people see that I make good spaces for art and therefore that continue to be the case. And, you know, I love to be engaged with conversation with curators, conservators, artists, and things like that too. So it come off in, in the work, yes. And talking about making spaces for art, what is that behind you? Is that a virtual background or are you actually in that kind of amazing cast concrete looks like some <laughs> it's actually my house yes this is where i've been working from home since march 11 so uh and a pool right there you don't see it so i'm not complaining and because i was on the plane a lot before before all of these so this is kind of a, a my moment to really inspect examine the, the nook and crannies of my house so you can look into my basically dining area and then the living room in the back yes yeah, I've been here by myself and my dog for two months, yes. And um, you're in Venice Beach, is that right? What's that? You're in Venice, Venice Beach. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, I've been here since uh, maybe tw uh, 12 years ago now, yes. And how is lockdown in that part of Los Angeles? Are people still staying in or are people starting to go out and go to the beach, use the boardwalk, what's happening? It's quite surreal. You, you're, you're, you're absolutely... Yesterday, someone posted an image between, you know, the beach uh, in New York and the beach in uh, uh, in Venice. Uh, like this last weekend, which is we have the memorable weekend, there's pack of people there, you know, as he, because I think the sun is very misleading because you see the sun, you see the summer is so strong, everyone feel like it's safe to go out. So that would be something that, you know, hopefully they're right, but you know, right now people, definitely desperate to go back to normal and the sun kind of allows them to feel the sense of normalcy. What about you? Have you been staying in or have you been going out as well? I've been starting to see some friends, you know, I got tested, everything is totally fine and, you know, and, and I'm pretty healthy. So, and I, I've been enjoying life. I've been swimming every day, walking my dog around. So I don't, I don't really feel that I'm locked in in that sense because at least I go out of my door three, three, four times a day. and, and because in California, we bless with the indoor outdoor. So a lot of time I'm just outside in the garden or in a pool. So that's kind of what I guess maybe keep me sane. Uh, and I really enjoy it. It's a, it's a kind of a, a Gaston Bachelard kind of moment <laughs> to put it a space. You inspect all these spaces in your house that you don't, don't really, you know, you overlooked in a way. And you told me earlier that you cut your own hair. I did, I did. This is. I'm not sure what the, what, the, what the bag can be showable, but I did, yes. And I actually think I did a good job. I actually just took photograph of it so that I can give it to my barber next time that I want this pandemic look. <laughs> and how actually did you do it? How, how did, you, did you? Well, did you I mean, the buzzer is definitely almost foolproof, right? Because they have this chill thing. You just keep 
riding at it and turn around. I don't have a lot of, a lot of, so I have to do it against like a little mirror. Yeah, but, and, but my hair is kind of unruly also. So it's kind of easy to, to kind of improvise. Oh, so you didn't use scissors, you used a shaver then, did you? Yes, yes. I would not be able to do it with scissor. I would, it would not be <laughs> an easy thing. I did do scissors in front a little bit, yeah. Because I've got to do mine soon. I keep tucking it back behind my ears. It's getting a bit out of hand. It looked very good on you. I, I have to say, you look very respectable. <laughs> That's the worst thing you could possibly say, respectable. <laughs> hey, you know, you have a platform with millions of followers. You know, respectable is something that could come in handy sometimes. Okay, cool about. I think you've got a presentation for us. Do you want to fire that up and talk about? Thank it? you. I would do that quickly, and so we can come back to our conversation here. Here we go. Uh, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you know, just to start, so that you know, I was born in Thailand, and uh, then went to school and live in Japan for about uh, fifteen years. And I know a lot of people have that, but these two cultures have profound impact on me in my thinking about culture, about architecture. You know, in a way, I always say that, you know, I talk about this uh, to that, you know, Thailand is like a little country between the, chi the, the, the giants, right? The chi China and India. Whereas Japan is like this skinny guy at the end. So if Thailand is a passenger in the middle seat with two big people in front, Japan is in the backseat all the, the whole world by himself because he's isolated from the rest of Asia. I think a lot about these, and I know it's a cliche and maybe a straw man thinking, but I felt that it reflects a lot in how we think of culture and how we think about design and ourselves. And this reflects so well in food. You know, Thai food is all about flexibility and nimbleness and blending and harmony of differences. You know, you have all the flavors salty, sweet, spicy, everything at once. And if you have dinner with a Thai family, you know that every bite is its own improvisation. You mix this and that together, you create. So we get bored very easily. So we tend to want to blend different things together. The improvisation and spontaneity is definitely part of Thai culture in general. Japanese is the opposite. Japanese is all about purity, about precision. About, about the clarity of ideas. And, you know, I was, you know, of course, growing up in Thailand, very fascinated by the sense of rigor, the sense of philosophy, the sense of clarity of concept I see in Japanese architecture. So that's when, when I was 20, I went to school uh, in, in Japan and, you know, I have a PhD. And after that, worked with Tadoando for some time. And we started, this is our office in Culver City, the same place we started uh, in 2014. I'm sorry, 2004. So we have around, you know, altogether 40 people between LA and New York. We really open. And, but, you know, over the office around four or five years, I immediately uh, felt uh, the problem of architecture. I felt that architecture, at least the way I see it, it's kind of like this. It's a perfect Howard Rogue fountainhead uh, that this is a genius architect who can draw a skyscraper by himself with no input from communities or clients or staff in half an hour. And he, and he alone is that person who know what the future holds. And I, of course, grew up loving that image, this rigor, this handsome, this clear, this, clear, this confident architect. But when I started to really focus on that, I realized that we're missing a lot of these you know, the edge of design by a diva is kind of gone. And in a way, you know, uh, the world has become so complex, not to mention diversity, sustainability, the, the aspect people living together. You know, I think architects have the possibility of glorifying and enhancing an idea. Sometimes it's your idea. Sometimes it's a dictator's idea. You see that throughout history. Right, so I think the time is that, yes, we want to glorify our own idea, but we should also possibly glorify and enhance the idea of a community, of a group of people. And these group of people, you can pick them, you can select them. They can work with you in the office, they can be part of the client team, they can be the community, they can be the thought leader that you come across, you know. So I then started to look at that and see how I use my project 
as a way of engaging interesting people I want to have a conversation with, you know, anthropologists, curator, artist, social worker, teachers, and all of these. So we're looking for opportunity for all of that to start to, to, uh, to engage and bring the best ideas to the table. And architects and designer not only just function as someone who actually just translate your ideas into a construction or an execution of design, you also have uh, almost like a conductor that you able to really integrate not all your own ideas, but many people's ideas, you know, visionaries, uh, social thinker, uh, so economists and other into the program and design of architecture and realize it through it. And one of the, uh, the key design that I have done, for example, is uh, this one right here, which I call the peacock and the octopus. It's an idea that, you know, we try to make building look very deconstructed and very unique on the outside. The wrapper is very different, but we hardly deconstruct the way that the components or composition of the building together. If you look at a plan of the building, they're still mostly centralized. And by being centralized, it's like a peacock. It's beautiful, it's contained, it's singular. But the problem is, you know, which I come across a lot in my work for museums and public building. When you have a centralized building, everything has to open together. You cannot just open one and not the other. So I've been advocating the idea of decentralized programming, allow the parts to be as strong as the whole. You know, so I was thinking about octopus as a mascot that it allowed, you know, the brains to be separate. It allowed the different parts to function on their own and be able to move forward. And we have deployed that into many projects we worked on. You know, we are designer, we, we're not just decorating the diagrams. We really work very closely with our clients from the beginning to try to define what is the project, you know, what can we achieve uh, together with the budget, with the time we all have. Client have expectation about what they want to do with that project. But we also want to listen to not only the users and the communities, the thought leader, you know, what is a museum of the future? Is a museum still even relevant? What can it do to bring people to the door? For, in, for example, in this case, we designed the student center and cafeteria for Carlat, which is an amazing art school in Valencia, California. And it's very difficult because it started by the artists and students say, no, we don't want any design. If you design anything, we're gonna hack it. We don't want any other intentions. We are the artists. So how do we design something that allow people with the free spirit to embrace it? So that learn us to listen, there's learn for us to really develop trust and the ideas together. Again, the idea of decentralized planning that I mentioned is a key to it because it allowed the different programs to work independently. You know, if you're a museum and if your cafeteria want to open late or if your classroom want to open late, if your galleries want to open late, you don't have to open the whole museum, you know, with 20 guards to do that. You become nimble and all of that. And that's why most museums do not open late because it, it's very costly. It's not an operation, it's built in into the planning of this institution. And if you don't change the planning, it's very difficult for, for institutions to be nimble. And that's why, you know, with the redefining and soul searching of a lot of institutions, I think architects and designers play a big role in how they can be surviving after the pandemic and after, you know, how people choose to engage with them. The other building, uh, the other part, you know, we not only do architecture, as I mentioned, we also have an integrated landscape, object design, installations involved, and we really bring that to the table. It doesn't mean that we want to do everything there is, but I like at the very beginning of the project that we have different people from different way of thinking together. You know, even if it's a project that doesn't have landscape design, I still like my landscape design a lead mark to be part of that because he's very poetic. He look at design, he look at project from different angle. We always reach out to non-designers. You know, we have usual suspects, sociologists, anthropologists, advertisement people that we bring on the project to talk about what a project should be, the impact it should have, and we slowly define the program and then lead on to the concept and the design. So for example, this is the art school 
at Pomona College, uh, which is a liberal art college uh, in uh, Clermont in California as well. So the idea that yes, it is an art school, but it's not just for the artists, it's for the whole campus. It's about how the science and the law students should also, also understand art. The art students always is, you know, the art building in general is an obsolete building at the edge of campus. You know, we want this building to be the building that if you are a law student and you become a Supreme Court judge, you remember when you went to Pomona College, you went, you walked through that art studio hall and you remember what art was. And when it's a chance for you to, to vote yes or no on an art project, you vote yes. And I think fundamentally it's so important uh, for a college like this, for an art building to not be a fortress of ivory or whatever, but it has to be an inclusive and welcoming aspect. Art itself is already very complicated and, and very, very intimidating to a lot of people. So how can we make something like that feel welcoming and feel they can be a part of? That has been a big mission in, in the work that we do uh, relating to art and design. Another project we just started about to construction is the first project I started in 2004 as a nonprofit pro bono and then slowly turned into fundraising, which is a bridge that we're planning uh, to uh, cross the Alla River. This is in North Hollywood in the tu Tuanga Wash area. So the idea, so when I went to the site, I was so struck by how this is, you know, LA River on a good day because the trash are going to the river. The river has become this concrete irrigation channel. And there's a lot of movement now, thankfully for the last 10 years that we want to turn our river into a, a, a real river with plant life, with, with life of humans, you know, bike ride, I mean, other things. But when I started 16 years ago, the river is still a painful thing, a scar into the city in a way. So this is a project that when I went to see it, I was so struck by how we treat the, the river so badly. So when I designed this bridge, I want this bridge to almost be, a, you know, kind of a, a response to the city. This is, if you treat the city with trash, uh, the river with trash, then the river will give trash back to you. So, you know, uh, this is 2004. So we started to think about how can we make the materials of, of, the, of the bridge out of, of the debris and the trash that we collected together with the community from the river itself, you know, anything from tires to chopping cart to glass to everything. And we really create a layer. I mean, it's, you know, when I come up with the idea, I was, oh God, I hope it doesn't come out gimmicky because I really want it to be something that subtle and, you know, touch people so sort they of think about it. And then when we present this to uh, our client is a nonprofit that's a work with the city and the county and any uh, Amber Corp engineer. So they love the idea. And we're now just about to start construction. The other project that relate to uh, the LA River, this is one branch of it, is the waterfall pavilion that we collaborated with uh, the artist Robert Jaravanich. Again, similar idea that how can we re-engage the water, how we can bring people live in nature, whether it's abstract or natural. So that's something is always being very interested in. So this, another project, it seems like I'm talking about water. Uh, this is my own house, which I'm sitting right here. This is what it looked like when pre-pandemic, when it's clean and open. And uh, this is the other part of it. So maybe I'm trying to show this, not just for sense of design, but hopefully it tell who I am. You know, I'm extremely curious. I like things that are eclectic, things that are contrasting one another. I don't like things to just supporting itself. I like aesthetic, which is complex. Of course, one of my favorite book is, you know, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. I really feel that the time has come, especially when the time, when we have to celebrate diversity and, and different voices to come into design. It's not just, you know, about, uh, you know, kind of, hand-holding, but it's about the idea of how do we really empower and enhance, uh, you know, vision of a group of people. Uh, some recent projects, this is a house that we're doing in Hollywood, just about to be finished. A house that in a way I was inspired by the, the shelled mushroom for a lot of reason, because it's, it's a cliff hanging, uh, you know, cantilever from a cliff. It also have to turn around the sun towards the view. So this is the inspiration and this is the end house. This is the rendering, but the house is almost done now. 
uh, even construction happening during COVID time because it's essential. Again, one of the concepts that I really believe in this is a concept of acupuncture architecture. And what I mean by that is that it's not about a plastic surgery. It's not about trying to make something look new. It's about really the intervention, which is strategic and precise, that not only solve the logistic problems, but bring the totality, the holistic wellness to the whole body. So when we add on or renovate a museum, we're not thinking about just the part that we added on. We think about how we can create this acupuncture that allow the overall of the museum or the overall of the community to be rejuvenated and in great health. I think that's something that I learned from, you know, urban design, as well as I learned from looking at any kind of communities and ecologies. Some recent project, we're working on the Rockefeller Wing at the Met, uh, which is a big substantial 40,000 square foot uh, renovation of one of the most important wing at the Met itself. Very excited about it. It's the arts from Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. So that's ongoing. Uh, and this is also featured in uh, Design. Uh, this is uh, the project that we were selected last year to build a very big multi use uh, performing arts center in Perm, Russia. It's uh, the, the Tchaikovsky, uh, the opera and ballet theater, but it have a lot of components under one roof. So that's the ongoing and it's actually moving very fast per schedule. The other project that we won around two and a half years ago is also the Ross Pavilion. This is uh, right in the heart of Edinburgh, just right under the castle. It is uh, an urban acupuncture in a sense, you know, the program called for a pavilion, but we end up doing a whole acupuncture for the park and the activities and program for the building. So I think that's uh, a part of my intro. I hope that I give a glimpse of people that don't know me and how I think and where I'm coming from. So thank you, Marcus. Thank you very much. And I, I, I had to sneak off and shut the window because our, the room I'm in overlooks a garden where they just the kids just started trampolining. <laughs> That's, I have a trampoline on my roof, which is always fun. Yes. And this is going to be also one of the last interviews I'm able to do from here because the neighbour is about to start a major construction project. So um, I don't know what we're going to do after that. Anyway. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, you said in your presentation about asking whether museums are still relevant and you showed some of your museum projects there. Um, what is the answer to that question, are museums still relevant? I mean, and how has that answer changed due to the pandemic? Well, I think that's definitely a very big question that everyone in the museum world is grappling with. You know, it, they're already difficult before pandemic. And now it's even more because of the proximity, because of the touch, because of the end of experience. I think museum, as we all know, is a product of the 19th century, right? It has to do with colonization. It has to do with culture. It has to do with, you know, identity. It's about, look what I have. It was a temple of treasures, right? It was a temple of art. And of course, it evolved into the gallery for paintings and design, but still it's a, a very close box. Uh, most museums that were when you started have no window. You put, you're supposed to go into the, the temple of the timeless. Art is supposed to represent something timeless and you have no connection whatsoever to society, right? And that has become a big problem, but every, pro every culture has their own problem. But in America, it's even so because it's seen as something that, you know, the rich and the upper class has, especially supporting by many things, right? I work in many places, especially in the South of America, where, you know, minorities were not allowed to go to museums. It was illegal for non-white to visit a museum up until maybe the 60s. So it's a very complicated story about what a museum life has been. So in that note, the soul searching is definitely necessary. I think museum definitely must be relevant. It could be relevant, but it's, it's impossible for you to maintain the same model that you have hundred years ago and think that it will work today. Something work, a post office might not work, a bank might not work, a museum might not work. So the redefining and the reinventing of what a museum experience is, is very crucial. 
And museums now are doing a great job at listening and engaging with the people. Yeah, museums are doing yoga in their studios. Museums are doing community outreach. They have a very strong education component to it. They have a very uh, important social aspects to it. People want to get married in museum. People want to do events in museum. I don't think that's bad, but I think if you lost your soul and do that for your purpose, then it, you lost your soul because art is there for a reason. So I think everyone is finding to find their own balance. So when we work on museum, that's what we talked about. It's not about the turnstile, it's about how many people come in, but can you really make impact for your communities? You know, you, if you're a small museum in a, in, a, in, a, you know, in a city of 2 million people, perhaps maybe you should not try to imitate the map of MoMA. Maybe you should try to see what it is that you can do within your own strength and your capacity. So we kind of come to that senses and thank God, I think clients are very intelligent now. They understand what they can do. And so the discussion is always about, okay, how much money do we have to invest in culture? Let's talk to the city, let's talk to the county, let's talk to communities. We have 50 million to invest in culture in the city. What's the best way to do it? And how can a museum be part of that? So I think that's important. Uh, discussion, which in a way changed from what was before, maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is okay, so and so have money. Uh, they want their legacy and the art collection to be seen by public. They're going to give 50 million to a wing, to a museum, and build that, right? So that model still exists. But a lot more people are questioning what culture means and what museum can be the best platform, not only just for the presentation of culture, but the production of culture which I think is a very important uh, issue that we all face today. So in, in concrete terms then, do you think that um, coronavirus is accelerating certain trends or, or will change physically what museums will be like in the future? Absolutely, I've been involved with, you know, I'm on quite a few board museums and so committee at many. So I'm on Zoom all the time with museum about trying to reopen. Right, so again, different problems uh, exist. If you're a, a, a museum before COVID, how do you open faster so you can actually maintain your visitorship and your livelihood? Uh, how you gradually open, you know, I think how many people you can let in, what are the protocols? So all of this is one thing, right? So definitely museum going experience will not be the same. You know, it will be the amount of rooms people can go in. Museum in a way is still not you know, it's really not good, uh, meaning you need to be redefined, but when you're comparing to performing art spaces, which is even more of a complex problem. I talked to my friend who's musicians and dancers and performing artists, and they were just dying. How can we go back to be in a sweaty room watching us play, right, off Broadway? So that is another issue, but I think so. Coming back to your question, uh, if you design museum after COVID for the museum that happening now, I think obviously everyone's thinking about digital, how you connect, you know, the brick and the click together. How can you create an experience that's over there, but also away. And I think they are sort of kind of talking about some art that are, you know, closer to people, some art that are not, right? Some museum would like to also promote a sense of intimacy, you know, whether you have a relationship with an artwork, so that could be done, but how many people can do that, right? So all of these questions come up. I don't think there's an answer to that yet, but I think people are starting to think about how to create, you know, an inspirational moment that you want in a museum that also respect their safety. Like you said, in some ways, museums are better able to, to cope with this crisis than other forms of culture, because you can at least spread people out in the museum, whereas concert hall if you spread people out then it sort of becomes unviable but you talked about um the indoor outdoor lifestyle in los angeles maybe that's the answer maybe museums just move outside why do you need to i think definitely so well you know but there's a sort of thing as a museum environment right art preservation uh criteria is so strict you know 72 degree with 50 percent humidity fluctuation by five percent so that's hold um, on a, on a god level. So every museum that wants to be called a museum need to have that kind of standard. 
So a lot of art are very fragile. So, you know, that cannot be uh, exposed to daylight or the kind of fluctuation in temperature and humidity. So that's kind of its own problem. But I do feel that, you know, people, and it happened, if, if you look at every pandemic, after that, you know, in their cycles, people always diverge back to nature. More parks are being made, more gardens are being made, uh, more outdoor restaurants, more outdoor activities, more plazas, all of these happens. So I think it's just, you know, in a way, you know, this is not the first pandemic that the world has seen. So, and I think even though we think we're so advanced, we're so different than the previous 100 years ago, you know, we still the same. You know, when you look at what the Bauhaus, which is founded in 1919, right, right in the middle of Spanish flu, you know, they were, they come out from TB and they, they got right into 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 Spanish flu. You know, the Bauhaus was very they're very smart. They understand exactly why and what the modern design can do to people's lives instead of stuffy furniture and you know nooks and crannies kitchen. The streamlined aesthetic that they promote could also be, you know, a, a lifesaver because it allowed bacteria and virus to stick less and easy to clean and so forth. So I think uh, this is the time when creative thinkers, not just designer, you know, economists and scientists and technology have to come together. And I think that such platform, I think, is so crucial. But I think maybe not more more important than the platform is who is that conductor. Because even if you gather the people together around in a table, unless you can pose a good question, unless you conduct the idea, the dialogue in the same way, we might not reach a good conclusion. And I do feel that architect's role is important in that, in that case. Not because we need to communicate and we can conduct the conversation. We have the ability to visualize. We can present the options and the ideas back to the table. And I do feel that a lot of time we listen in order for us to do what we want. I mean, can we listen to do what we want, but also what everyone wants as, as a group? I think it's not selfless, but I think it's self-interest in a kind of a holistic way. And you mentioned in your talk that museum, museums were sort of relics of the 19th century, and yet they're still very popular, right? And you're still busy designing new museums or extensions to existing museums. So they, they, they must be doing something right. There must be something about this old fashioned typology that keeps it still relevant. What is that? What is, what is it, apart from the research and the preservation modes of a museum, what is it about them that make people want to go to them? Well, I think that for me, I can only speak maybe from my own uh, experience and, and values. I really see that art and artists are windows uh, into the unknown worlds, right? Just the same thing with musicians and, you know, movies, movie directors and many others, all art form. They afford us this possibility to look into different people's lives and different way of living. And I think we can call it spirituality, you can call it timeless, you can call it intangibility, but it has an aspect of it, you know, that allow you know, Picasso say art is, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, that wash the, the dirt of the soul, right? So it allows you to understand that there's something bigger than your day-to-day -day living. So on that note, I agree with you, museum is still relevant. Especially now, I think the Renaissance of Museum has come again. I think it's relevant as long as it really cares about the conversation it wants to have with communities. Museum used to be a place that say, okay, this is a temple of culture. If you want to learn and be sophisticated, you have to come and wash it and learn about what we have in our inventory, right? That was, you know, maybe the 19th century model and everyone that wants to be educated, want to be part of society, need to go to a museum to, to, to you know, to, to study your Cezanne and your Picasso and your Gauguin and so forth, right? It's about being part of society that is admitted now, I think it's more about discovery. It's more, it's not about knowing, it's about feeling and understanding. And so people go to museum with different reasons now. They look at and they see what they like and museum allowed that to happen. Before that, it's only one curator who interpret why this painting is good and what that painting is not good. Now the voices, not only of a curator, you know, of a critic, of a visitor, 
of a school children, you know, of, you know, anyone can have an opinion about what it is. And sometimes it's, it's pretty in, insightful. It doesn't mean that every opinion counts, but allow the different voices to be heard and you can choose what that is. A museum is getting good at that too. So it become one of the last place where visions and opinions are being exchanged. And I think, you know, like what Hannah Aaron mentioned, you know, human have, you know, uh, labor, work and action, right? And action can be political, cultural or spiritual. You know, human being cannot be reduced to just labor and work. You know, we need to find our own mission. And I think that museum and art allow people to project, you know, their the meaning into a, long, a larger aspect. They're wondering about why, you know, you know, of course, Van Gogh and someone like that, what he did in his life and so forth. So I do feel that, you know, it will still be relevant. But now, instead of being a monologue that used to be, it become a dialogue or even a conversation with a lot of voices. And it, given that you're saying that um, museums have become about discovery and also the experience, physical experience of going there and to take pictures and to meet your friends and go to the cafe. Um, can all of that be achieved without people actually going to museums? Like so museums could become places where art culture is conserved and studied academically and preserved and the public experience of it could happen in another way maybe. Yes, and, and I think many more museums are doing that. You know, just like great art, Great museums have different layers of appreciation, right? If you have five minutes between meetings, do you want to hop in, have a cup of coffee, and be in the museum experience? Possibly look at a sculpture. Yes, you should be able to do that. You have a whole afternoon on a Sunday, and you want to explore some subject. You want to look at Egyptian art. You know, you look at aspect. You can do that. I think uh, I think that barrier hopefully is coming down. That people are now seeing museum as a third place. You know, I mean, I'm, I know that creative people use museum for that, uh, that reasons. If they have a deadlock, you know, whether in their work, even though you're an, an accountant, like, oh, well, I need a problem. I mean, you go to a museum, you let your mind, your mind wander, right? You look at certain things and you have a cup of coffee. So more and more museums are allowing uh, such activities to exist. It's not uh, like our crash course on art that you have to go in and go out come in one way and go into a maze and you go out and you enlighten. That experience doesn't uh, exist anymore. Now it's become, you know, depending on your time, depending on your interest, you can pick the kind of experience you want in a given museum. And that's why what I mentioned in, in my presentation, the idea of decentralizing the museum is very important. Because, and I know that uh, by listening to museum people, everyone wants to open late, everyone wants to have a life. You know, museum open 10 to 5. That's when everyone at school and working. And the weekend they're exhausted. They want to go to the park, they want to go to the beach. No one wants to go and have a full on education. Right, so if the museum can start it to kind of, not maybe, you know, a lot of museums open on Thursdays and Fridays now until 10. But let's say if you can, okay, well, uh, the bookstore can open late, the restaurant can open late, one of the gallery can overlay, the cinema can overlay, right? So it allows different pieces to open and it doesn't allow, and I know that because what killed it is the operation. It come up in every conversation uh, in museum design. Like we want to be relevant. We want to be relevant for young people, for young families, for urban migrants. How do we be part of their lives? But when I go out and talk to them, the, the same answer come back. So we cannot go because we were working. And weekend, yes, we can go, but we're exhausted. We want to be home and watch TV, right? So that's a way of doing that. And I think design can be part of that. Of course, operation, open late is, is very doable, but unless we design the museum so that it can be, you know, kind of decentralized, allow different activities to, to open on its own time, it would be very difficult for it to, to, to have a longer kind of operation. One of the things that's come true very strongly in the last two months of lockdown is that it seems to me the thing that people want most that they can't have is to be outside in public places they want to be on the beach they want to be in the park they want to go to the forest we, we the first time we left London as a family was two weeks ago and we drove to a, a forest near us thinking we could just 
disappear into the trees on our own. Of course, everyone else had the same idea. <laughs> there was nowhere to park. Um, the youth, and you mentioned before that, you know, the, the, the last, the Spanish flu pandemic, tuberculosis caused a big cultural shift and the Bauhaus then responded to that. Do you think we could be seeing something similar now? And could that shift be, as you suggested, that people want nature instead of culture, instead of theatres, instead of museums, they want trees and grass and rivers to swim in? You're absolutely right. I agree. You know, but again, um, I think there's two things, right? Even after the Spanish flu, you know, which gave birth in a way to the Bauhaus, people were also going back to nature. It wasn't a one uh, line that, okay, well, for now we're going to go to this streamlined machine aesthetic because it's easy to clean and metal, you know, cellar steel, Master Brian used cellar steel tubular because it was easy to clean, right? Comparing to the cushions and the kitchens of his previous generation. So it was also justified by uh, the fact that it's easy to clean. And so I think even at that time, people were going back to nature. So yes, so my first answer is yes, absolutely. Nature will be a big part of it. And hopefully it will be here to stay because, you know, we finally humbled by the invisible, you know, something as, as overlooked and in, invisible as a virus can kill us tremendously, right? We no longer at the top of the food chain or as, as we thought. So the humility, I think will allow us to, you know, uh, as social animals, understand one another. I hope it built empathy as people trying to survive together, they need other people. I hope that the social distancing, which I don't like that term, I, I call it physical distancing, that it doesn't mean that our uh, spirit doesn't want to be together. You know, we, that, that's part of that. And, and so I think that's on, on the natural process, I think that's very short it's gonna happen. But in the model, and obviously I don't want to try to predict anything because it would be wrong, if you need to, to follow the footstep of the Bauhaus, right? When they were using the, the aesthetics that has to do with anything, with spirituality in Kandinsky, in the machine aesthetic that come from the Marcel Breyer, in the Gropius with, with the, the thinking, the rational thinking design and all of that, which is, I think now we're going even another dimension because I, I, I predict that design and maybe something that you have done is no longer its own discipline. Design just gonna be like philosophy. It's gonna be something that everyone needs. You know, it's not, you know, I think philosophy exists in everything because it's about the reason why we do certain things. So right? design is the how of it. So once you have the philosophy to know why you do something, design is how you do something. And I think that's become crucial. So, on that note, I feel like we will be looking at, you know, nature, but in a very deep interpretation. We already be looking, you know, even before the pandemic, sorry, my dog is excited. Uh, that, uh, because we're already looking at design learning from na nature, by own mimicry, you know, many other things, you know, trying to kind of imitate, integrate the aspect of natural, natural and artificial. I think that would drive even more into that. I think finally, I think will also be possibly bridge uh, the chasm be, uh, between digital and, and physical, which are called the digital. Because in reality, sometimes you don't remember whether you actually experienced that, especially now you explain to Zoom and for many other things, everything completely blend into your head, like Thai food, right? You like, was it happened to me or is it, if I see this in a magazine or this is on, a website or everything is jumbled into it as we consume so much more information. And the media, uh, which in a way used to be the message, is now less and less of the message because once, once we consume so much media, it becomes its own little jumble that we kind of experience. So I feel that in our generation, the contribution to define what that aesthetic look like, you know, will be, will be, will be real, yeah. And um, you mentioned the LA River project, but is, did that project get built? Because you just showed renderings of it. The bridge is under construction. Yeah, it takes a long time because we have to raise the money. And then it's a city owned, but it's on the county land and the army job of engineer 
cover that. So we start with a group called Spar, which is a public art uh, group that painted the wall of the river 40 years ago. And so they have zero money. So we start to raise it and then the permit get expiring. So we have to get renewed and then they have a new code going on. So it's, it, yeah, so it's finally getting built. Yeah, after 16 years. And what about the plans to clean up the river and put nature back? Is that still progressing? Because Frank Gehry was involved with one section. Absolutely. Of Frank is a big part of that. And of course, his repetition also gained a lot of support for that project. I think it's one, it's one of the major projects, but there's so many other projects involved along the river. We're really embracing beautifully. I'm involved in one particular section uh, about the bike path on the river. Uh, there's a period of around six miles uh, down uh, downtown LA that there's no bypath. So if you can actually connect the bypath together, you can actually bike from the ocean up to Pseudo City, 25 acres, 25 miles, and commuting would be a breeze, right? So I'm kind of working with that note, but yes, uh, I think there's a lot of people that are really focused on uh, plant, the plant life in the river, Mark Thorman, uh, our landscape uh, director, has been involved about the invasive species in the river and trying to see what's edible and what's not edible. And he liked the idea of this natural winding. And so he's looking at what grow by, na by nature in the river and how can we, instead of trying to impose something else, cultivate that because you know everything is, is, is living, yeah. This is one of the themes that's come up in several of the interviews I've done. Um, particularly with Chris Precht, actually, this idea that we've almost been conditioned as a society to think of um, uh, city as man-made, nature something outside. In LA, that's particularly pronounced because you have the city, which is artificial, and then but you have amazing mountains and canyons and everything like that. Uh, and the river is almost like a, a sacrifice, a, sacri a, a, a dead animal sacrifice that goes through the city. It was once a, a natural thing, and now it's um, pretty horrible from my experience. I was in LA in September and I walked across the LA River in the downtown. Uh -huh. So that it could be kind of a huge symbolic gesture for the city if that river could be turned back into something that has a resemblance of the wilderness, even if it's not a true wilderness. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, it's a cliche, but, you know, in a way, Asian cities or even LA are made so differently, right, from London, from Paris, from the Western European cities. You know, we're not a citadel. We're not, we, we mostly are sprawl. And so nature has a different meaning to us in that sense. When you look at Hong Kong or when you look at, uh, you know, Tokyo, you know, and that's an aspect. Yes, people love nature, but somehow within that density, they were able to really find a balance that allowed them to coexist. Otherwise people will go crazy. It, I'm not saying that it's more natural than let's say a place like London or Paris, but I think people have different way of dealing with, 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 with that particular notion. You know, we don't have a, a real parks or gardens in the Western, uh, in the Eastern sense. A lot of time in Japan, uh, the biggest green spaces in the city are actually the shrines and the temples. Right? And so these function as public park or community gardens for a lot of people around it. And so that relation was made not only by religions, but also by communities and societies. So different people have different way of dealing with that. And so the, the dichotomy, uh, maybe in the East, the, the dichotomies of nature and culture is not as severe because we never really you know, see ourselves as not part of nature in some sense, even though you know we more and more uh, away from it. I think we still see, feel the body, the water in our body, we also feel the connection of temperature, we just feel that one living is another living is all connected. So on the, on the intangible aspect, we kind of feel it, yeah. Okay, We're, it's been amazing, Kalapak. We've, Kalapak, we've almost um, filled a whole hour and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not going to loft it. It's you know nine o'clock uh, on a Wednesday, but you know. But anyway, uh, thank you for your time, Marcus. It's really been enjoyable, and thank you for being such a great platform for holistic design. Thank you so much, and I, I'll come and pay you a visit next time I'm in LA. Anytime we can walk a river together, and I can give you some places that hopefully change your mind about Los Angeles. 
Are there nice parts of the river? Because I'm more interested in your swimming pool, to be honest. That can be arranged, but <laughs> there, I also want to, you, you to, to, I would do the best to, to, to show the best light of the river to you. Okay, brilliant. I look forward to that. Nice thank to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.